I had everything planned out when the day came. My room was neat and a note was left on the kitchen table. My parents would be home from work soon. I made one last post on Facebook explaining what I intended to do, where, and why. Sent a few last text messages to friends apologizing and thanking them. Then, I went to the bridge. I sat on the rail for an hour. No one came. He was born, and they called him a mistake. Parents fought, split, and they called him the reason. Mother called him it, and father didn't call on him no more. School came around. He struggled and stammered, and the kids called him weird. Then they called him names. Then they hit. Teachers called it, boys will be boys. Trying to fit in, they called him pathetic, so he grew up without them and they called him a loser. When he looked at girls, they called him ugly. Then puberty hit, and he was a creep. Demoralized, his studies suffered. High school rang out, and they called him a disappointment. He found a low-paying, menial job, and they called him a failure. Years went by. Now they called him an outcast. His company downsized and laid him off. Not a team player, they said and called him expendable. Middle-aged now, he tried to work again, but poor social skills left him unwanted. Now politicians and pundits called him a parasite, a leech on the system. Sickness came and they called it pre-existing, not covered. His finances drained, he became destitute, and they called him lazy, a bum. Cold, alone, and forgotten, depression set in deep and they called him a burden. Without hope, he finally took the only thing left he wanted to, his life, and they called him a coward. Kevin was 18 years old. He had the house to himself, as his parents were on a trip for the weekend and his sister was on a concert. He played video games the whole evening. Suddenly, he realized that it was 1 a.m. He went to bed. But wait, didn't the concert end at 12? His sister should have been home by now. He sent a text message. Hey, sis, where are you? No answer. He waited five minutes and called his sister. No answer. Slightly concerned, he went out to the car and started driving. 30 minutes of calling and still no answer. He eventually arrived. Two police cars were there. Three officers who hadn't noticed him were talking. God damn it, another shooting. At least the guy killed himself afterwards. All of them died? Yeah, most were standing in the open. Most? There was this one girl who managed to hide behind the porta potty. How did the shooter find her? We don't know. We suspect she may have made some noise. Caden and Tate play in the yard across from mine. They do every day, and every day, I hope that they'll come over. Mommy doesn't have enough time to take me over, but that's okay. I watched them for a few hours today. Sometimes they go around back where I can't see them, but today they played mostly in the front. Daddy's car pulls up and he comes inside. He gives me a kiss and asks me how the day went. I just smile. He asks mommy whether I've had anything for dinner. Then she gets some yogurt. As she takes me out of my wheelchair so that she can pump it into my stomach easier, I see Caden and Tate get called in for dinner. Doesn't look like we'll play today, but there's always tomorrow. My father is a loving, caring man. I absolutely despise him. When I was six, he became a single parent. That's when my hatred began. People quickly noticed. They would ask if he did bad things to me at home, even accused him of it. He didn't. 
Others asked if it was because he didn't spend enough time with me anymore, as he had to start working double shifts in my mother's absence. Truth is, he tried as much as he could. When I was 11, we visited the shopping mall. Walking through the kiosks, he glanced over his shoulder to see a beautiful, even though not too expensive, metal wristwatch. He set down an empty pickle jar in his room and he would put all of his spare change into it. There would even be one dollar bills, sometimes. After some months, he saved enough. We went back to the shopping mall and I mentioned I had always wanted a Game Boy. He decided I was more important than his stupid watch and bought it for me. When I was 16, he met a woman. He had a hard time at first, feeling he was betraying his long gone wife. After a few weeks, they started dating normally. He was happy again. I didn't accept their relationship. I had some talks with my father, where he tried to make me see that she was a good person. I knew she was. My one argument would always be, it's hard seeing you with someone that's not mom. But to be honest, that never bothered me. Heartbroken, he ended their relationship as he always put me first. When I was six, my mom died in an accident. I couldn't understand how the woman I loved the most in the world, who had been there for and with me since the day I came to this world, was gone from my life, from one moment to another. The pain was too much, and I'd often think how I wouldn't have had to go through this grief if I hadn't loved her as much as I did. It might have even been a happy time if I had hated her. I don't know when my dad will leave this world too, but it'll happen one day. That's for sure, and all I know is I can't go through the same pain again. Dad, you are the best man I've ever known. I hate you. When I was a child, I had the horrible, overwhelming fear of being forgotten. I couldn't bear the thought of my existence being erased from the world, completely. One day, this brought me to tears, but my mom helped me feel better by telling me that she'll never forget me. Even if she's dead, her spirit will always be with me. This made me feel better well into adulthood. That is, until she uttered the words, Who are you? As I stood next to her hospital bed. I couldn't tell you I was sorry. I couldn't tell you how much your warmth meant to me. I couldn't say I love you when you needed it most. I couldn't call your name as your life slipped away before my ripening eyes. I couldn't find the words to express how much I would miss you. I couldn't say that I was crying for you even as I rested in your arms on that hospital bed before the doctors pried my helpless body from your grasp. I couldn't speak because I hadn't yet learned how. Rachel looks up from her toys. Mommy and Daddy are watching her lovingly, but say nothing. She giggles and they wave. Four years later, she looks up from her worksheet. Twelve, she shouts. Her teacher tells her to shut her mouth. Didn't she know that nobody likes little girls who don't know when it's their turn to speak? Rachel says nothing for the rest of the class. Four more years. Rachel looks up from the dance class floor. She raises her hand. I can teach Maria how to do it. Maria tells her to shut up. Nobody likes a show off. Rachel doesn't volunteer again. Four more years pass. Rachel sits at her internship, waiting for the papers her boss was supposed to leave her before the meeting. Make sure you get your job done was his number one motto. She figures as she went to grab them from him. Excuse me, can I interrupt real fast for those documents? She asks during a lull. The room looks astounded. Her boss tells her they'd talk later. She says nothing then or during their talk, and she never interrupts a meeting again. More years later, her boyfriend proposes. 
They'd been having some issues lately, her heart told her no. She covers her mouth with her hands, holding back tears. Family, friends, and strangers look on, waiting for an answer. Rachel nods and says nothing. Years and years, her husband wants kids. She agrees without another word. Her mother wants her family to move back home. She listens and does as she's told. Her job wants her in this department, then that. No one asks her what she wants, and she doesn't tell them. The years left her dwindling fast. She lays in her room, surrounded by the ones she loves at every possible moment. Any regrets? Her children half-jokingly ask her. As she lay coughing in her bed, Rachel smiles but says nothing.